Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Muffy's in Fulham. Muffy, what would you like to say? A lot of what you've said definitely makes sense. Well, that's um, the first time the, for everything. It, actually, sometimes it doesn't, but today it did. <laughs> Carry on. The, I, I completely agree with you that the institute of monarchy and individual people are not beyond reproach. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has problems. And nothing, nothing can be beyond reproach. What do you think Johnson was playing at then when he said that last night? I didn't actually watch it on television. No, you don't have to. I've just played watching, you the clip. I was watching to part, part of it yes. or, or listening to part of it on the radio. Yes. Um, no, I agree with you. Nothing is beyond reproach. But I, I mean, why do you think he said it? I don't quite... I mean, it could have just been an off-the-cuff comment that he, on reflection... Possibly, he, he, but then he, what, what did Corbyn say? He, he said, I think... He just a lovely the, laugh about it. No, he didn't. He said, I think the monarchy could do with some improvement. Well, he's right there too, but the audience made that sound bad. They should not have had an audience there because all that clapping and laughing, silliness, actually undermined what Corbyn said, which did make sense. Yes, you might be right. It's a slight, it's a slight digression. I'm, I'm, I, I suppose what I'm trying to nudge you towards is... Is, is, is some sort of observation about the class-based nature of what Boris Johnson said. Because if we were to sort of amicably conclude that, that, that the monarchy represents the pinnacle of poshness, Johnson, to me, seems to subscribe to a school of thought that says once you achieve a certain degree of social status, then the normal rules don't apply to you. And I would say that about himself. What and I might be reading too much into it, he seems to be saying that if you are at the pinnacle of social status in this country, then you are beyond reproach. You're beyond criticism. You're beyond scrutiny. And that's terrifying. Oh, absolutely. That would be terrifying. But did he actually mean that? As I don't know. That's why I was the, wondering. The other thing I'd like to, to bring up, if I may, yes. is your, the way you are now um, referring to... Andrew Windsor. Yes, is that incorrect? That is absolutely incorrect. How, what should Whatever it be? Whatever you think about him, his correct title is His Royal Highness Prince Andrew. The paedophile's friend. And it's the same with Meghan. We, we, everybody seems to refer to her as Meghan. She's not Meghan. She's now the Duchess of Sussex. Well, she's whoever she wants to be. No, she's not. Yes, That's she her is. title. Okay, can I say His Royal Highness Prince Andrew, the paedophile's friend? How many friends have you got that may have done silly things or bad things. I well, have some. None, I none, have some. none that have been jailed for it, Muffy. How many have you got? None that have been jailed, but they've, I've had a number that have done silly things. You, you, you think that raping teenage girls gets filed under silly things? No, absolutely I not. I think you've delighted us for long absolutely enough. Not. Alex is in Camden. Alex, what would you like to say? Uh, I think this is a witch hunt on Prince Andrew and uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein. I think this is uh, it's anti-Semitism. I think, uh, Jeff Good Elson grief, I thought the last sense. call was mad. Amanda is in Datchet. Amanda, what would you like to say? Amanda, yes. I just want to know, um, is it fair that we blanket the whole royal family for one member's actions? If somebody in my family did something wrong, would it be fair that everybody dissed my whole family for their actions? I don't know that anyone is doing that, are they? Well, I think that's what came over last night on the TV, was that, you know... Um, well, let's listen, like, let's listen to it again. Let's listen to it again. Is the monarchy fit for purpose? Jeremy Corbyn. It needs a bit of improvement. <laughs> Mr Johnson. The institution of the monarchy is beyond reproach. Is, is... Where, where's the... I'm sort of tarring everyone with the same brush thing there. First of all, I think Jeremy Corbyn is in no position to... No, uh, I didn't ask you that. I asked you, the, where's the tarring everyone with the same brush bit there in what I just played Well, you? I think the monarchy needs some improvement, does it? I think it does it. I think so you're agreeing with Jeremy Corbyn? I agree that... No, 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 no. I don't think the um, monarchy needs some improvement. You don't think they should get rid of the man who hangs out with paedophiles? So tell me if you are friends. I'm asking you questions. Yeah. I'm asking you questions. Yeah. Would the monarchy be improved okay. by getting rid of a member who hangs around with paedophiles? 
No. Right. This is a fascinating phone in, and I, 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 I'd just like you to expand on that. So if, sure. you, if you were friends with a paedophile, you don't think that your status would be improved by not being friends with them anymore? I think you have to look at the whole picture. I am. Am I friends with a paedophile because he's a paedophile? Or am I a friend with a friend? Here you are on the radio. Here you actually Sorry. are on the radio talking about the uh -huh. various circumstances in which you could be friends with a paedophile. I bet you didn't think this was going to happen when you woke up this morning, did you? Uh, do you want to let me finish? Not really. <laughs> OK, then there's no point me phoning in. I don't like talking to people who can be friends with paedophiles, actually, or, or people who, who, who split hairs over it. But it's good that you agreed with Jeremy Corbyn. I bet you weren't expecting to do that when you woke up this morning, either. I did not agree with Jeremy yep, Corbyn. Yeah, 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 yeah. John has called from Croydon. Hello, John. Hello there, yeah. Um, yeah, she, I think they're all getting into the lying mode at the moment. Um, I didn't watch the main debate last night, but after the um, I'm a Celebrity last night, I listened to Jo Swinson. She was being interviewed. And the first thing she said was that we have listened to what everybody is telling us. Now, that's a blatant lie. She hasn't listened to 17.4 million people straight away because she, she, she wants to um, revoke Article 50. Well, so they, yeah, and the Lib Dems... lie, even though she said. Well, the Lib Dems also have some questions to answer about these, these bar yeah. charts that they keep producing, which are rather misleading. That's right. So yeah. I think they're all at it, Sheila, and, you know... Um, politics are in a bit of a mess at the moment to be honest with you but are, are you afraid that once these um the, the, almost the you know the the rules and the manners uh, you know manners are very unofficial but the manners that build up around a particular situation the culture that builds up around a particular situation can have a great deal of power and the culture used to be that there was shame in being found yeah. to be lying to people <laughs> where's the shame gone yeah, they don't. Just, they just don't seem to care anymore. They can see. They, they seem to have this attitude: we can say what we like, and people will believe us, and uh, we don't care. It's so Trump. It's awful, what really. was it? What was it? Donald Trump said, "I could, I could shoot someone dead on Fifth Avenue, and my support, my my voters <laughs> would stay with me." Yeah. I mean, that's chilling, isn't it? Because actually, mm. we. I'm not suggesting anybody's doing that, but but yeah. but the, I think there is something chilling when people lie without shame. Yeah, yeah, it's very bad. Yeah, not good at all. Well, how how do you get so, your head around it as a voter, John? What what are you wrestling with? Well, unfortunately, she, I, I, I didn't watch the main debate last night because I already know which way I'm voting, so I can't be bothered to watch them anymore. I'm, I'm fed up with a lot of them, to be honest with you. But um, because I'm a believer in Brexit, unfortunately, um, I know which way I'll be voting, so I will be voting Conservative. But I've not got a great deal of faith in, in Boris, I must admit. Um, and why, I don't why? think he'll on be in charge what, of on the what basis? Tories. On what basis yeah. do you mistrust Boris? Yeah. But no, why? In what way do you mistrust him? Well, you know, um, he, he's full of bluff and bluster and, uh, you know, all the things he said, OK, it wasn't his fault that he couldn't deliver Brexit come at the end of November because uh, Hillary Benn put a stop to that. But, um, you know, it's just the way he goes about it, his, his mannerism. And uh, I just think he'll be used by the Conservatives to deliver Brexit and then... Um, Six months next year, I think they'll have a new leader. I can't see them putting up with him for too long, to be honest with you. Well, the, the Ben Act only stopped no deal for now. Um, but, yes. but Parliament actually voted through to a second read of the second reading of, of the Brexit bill. And then Boris Johnson pulled the plug on that. Yeah. To so, have a general um, election. It's playing, yeah, it's playing so, games, um, you know, isn't it? And, uh, it's all a game, Sheila, unfortunately, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it all pans out. But, but uh, do you, sound, all, all, you, you but, sound tired talking about it. Why are you still prepared to give them your vote if you're just exhausted and despondent about it? Want, I want Brexit done. I want, I want to get it done. I've, I, I voted for Brexit always. I was um, um, a great believer in Brexit before we had the referendum. I knew, knew we had to leave. Um, I'm very, I mean... I don't know whether you've read it, Sheila, but I've been watching the European Parliament programme for many years now and the political project that the EU have got in mind for every, all, all EU countries is quite frightening. All right, John, I'm going to leave it there because it's time for the news at two, but thank you very much indeed for your call. John, maybe the embodiment of why Boris Johnson keeps saying, let's get Brexit done. They'll have made a calculation that there are enough exhausted, despondent Johns out there in the world. Now, as I mentioned, we had a major policy announcement today from Boris Johnson. He was on national insurance. It's not clear whether he actually meant to make this announcement, but anyway, this is what he told the BBC. If we're lucky enough to be re-elected, so the first budget, we will do 
we will go up to nine, the 9,500 threshold, and that will, as I say, put £500 into the pockets of, of everybody. We will then take a further step and we'll set out the timescale at the budget uh, in uh, up to 12,500. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined by Conservative Minister Brandon Lewis. So there we had uh, Boris Johnson there telling the BBC that raising the threshold for national insurance contributions to 9,500, it's about 8,600 at the moment, uh, would save taxpayers £500 a year. Sounds good, but there's a problem. It's not true, is it? Well, it's 8,632, I think, to be precise. And yes, in the first budget it will go up to 9,500. What the Prime Minister was outlining is that, in due course, our ambition is to get to 12,500. No, 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 no he wasn't. What he said 000, was, a house. in the first budget, we will go up to the 9,500 threshold. That's raising it by just shy of £1,000. And that will, as I say, put £500 into the pockets of everybody. It's not true, is it? Well, I hadn't heard that interview until literally you just played it. What I, what I can say to you is the numbers, as I understand them to be, and what I've seen in the calculations, we're going to move the first budget to 9,500. And how much about, will that be worth? That's the equivalent of about £100 per person. No, no it's not. But, okay, it's well, not. My understanding it's, is about £100 per It's worth person. about £85 a year. Okay. We, we spoke to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and we did this when, the Prime Minister, when Mr Johnson, as he was then, promised this in the Tory campaign. So it's £85 a year this is worth, not £500. Well, I haven't seen the IFS's calculation. Our calculation is it's worth about £100 per person. Well, can we both agree it's not £500? No, the t if we, our ambition is to get to 12500 That would be worth about £500 yeah, per person. Yeah, but he said 9500 so I mean, it, look, you, last night you set up a spoof fact-checking account on Twitter. But you're not so good at fact-checking your own facts, are you? Well, I'm giving you the facts very clearly now, I think, Andrew, which is this initial budget will move it to nine and a half thousand. That's a tax cut for about 31 million people of £100 a year. Our ambition is to make sure they're £500 a year better off right. by moving it further. But let's also be very clear about last night. As your clip just showed, that was always very clear that it was from CCHQ. Its Twitter handle was still CCHQ yes. Press. Just a pity they didn't fact-check the Prime Minister well, saying it's worth £500 I think if you look when at what, it's closer to 100 and we think 85. Well, if, I think if you look at what that was referring to in terms of that debate last night, it was quite rightly calling out some of the misrepresentation from the But you're part. misrepresenting what the value of this increase of the threshold is. Uh, it's not 500, it's under 100. You think about that, we think 85, so does the IFS. Uh, Mark is in Canterbury. Hello, Mark. Hello, Eddie, good evening. What do you think of soaking the very, very rich? Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, I must entirely agree with your uh, previous uh, person um, Which who one? spoke about Bill, about who spoke about Bill Gates, Mark and the wealth, the, the wealth that people uh, bring into this country. The trouble with with Labour is that they dress they dress manifestos up, they change the narrative slightly, but Labour has always been about tax and spend, tax and spend. Uh, comrades uh, Corbyn and McDonald are two of the most dangerous people. I I believe that this country could ever elect for government. They will break this country. Uh, without, without investment from wealthy people, without wealthy people uh, bringing, bringing finance into the country, starting up, up businesses which become successful, uh, how does that stimulate employment? Everybody needs wealthy people to some extent to, to, you know, to rely on them for providing uh, the jobs that we all, that we all have. And in fact, there was a caller on Sheila's programme earlier who spoke about what's happened in France. Absolutely spot on. If you take away all the wealth, all the wealthy people go. France as a country is in, in, is in dire financial straits and has been for a good number of years because there's been this total sort of um, egalité, fraternité, etc. in France where everybody's got to have the same. I'm afraid to say in life, not everybody does have the same. And you need the wealth creators to actually stimulate the economy. And as I say, I don't care what Corbyn and, and McDonald are up to, and I'm not particularly politically motivated, um, but really, if we're just going to go tax and spend, tax and spend, tax and spend, where does that leave the big people as much as the little people? And I'll just add, 
Corbyn and, and McDonald particularly talk about billionaires and millionaires. There are a hell of a lot of millionaires in this country these days. With great respect to your, your callers, and I'm sure I'll be lambasted for saying it, but actually a million quid these days is not a hell of a lot of money. But billionaires, a lot of Mark. Have got an awful, billionaires. Awful there are 151 well, billionaires in the country. Are you honestly telling me? I hear what you what? say. Let me finish my thought. Are you honestly yeah. telling me that it wouldn't be possible to tax them a little more money that they uh, might not miss particularly, but would have a great impact on the people in this country with least? I'm absolutely with that, but will it have a great impact o on this country? All of these political parties at the moment are suddenly coming up with vast sums of money to, to try and buy votes from us all at this election. I mean, I could say, where has all this money been that the Conservatives are now promising? Sure, where is sure. all the money going to come from? And, and Mark, we're getting the, into that over this political season, but, the, but, but my question is about billionaires, and I'm just wondering whether there's any problem with asking them to pay some I don't more. have any problem with that at all. But, okay. but my question again is where is all this money going to go? Do we really believe all these political parties that they're going to spend more money on this, that and one thing and the other? And it has been written and been said that the NHS is part of the battleground of this election. Why is it that everybody believes that just throwing money at institutions in this country is the answer? It is not necessarily the answer. Well, do you believe that cutting money from these institutions is the answer? <laughs> no, I don't. But I think... I think management management is very largely the answer in a lot of businesses in these in this country and and I go back to your 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 guys that you had at the top of the program when you talk about Bill Gates. Bill Gates has done an enormous amount for this world for for business for revolutionizing the way that business runs. People should be a little bit more grateful I think for the people that are wealth creators. Mark, thank you. Alan next in Mill Hill. Hi Alan. Hi, Eddie. How are you? I'm good. What do you think of billionaires? Uh, well, I think Labour have got this obsession with the billionaires. I mean, there's 101? 151. Billionaires in, 151. So, OK, 151 billionaires and this obsession with billionaires. I mean, of the, there's 100,000 millionaires, I believe, in the United Kingdom, I think, 100,000, of which those 100,000 contribute... 29% of the UK's tax revenue. 29%. So you drive those people away, and those 100,000 or those 151 billionaires, we're going to be left back in this Marxist era of no food on the shelves, a bit like, a bit like Russia. Well, Alan, Alan, let's, well, let's, let's unpick this for a moment. Let's leave aside the millionaires, if we may. Let's talk about the 151. It would be quite something if they were all, as you put it, driven away. Uh, where would the harm be in getting them to pay a bit more tax? Do you know what they contribute in income tax? They probably contribute about 30%, or, or they probably contribute about 15% of the income tax. So you're going to drive them away. But why is there... Well, 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 why, why are you assuming that they would be driven away? What if it was... I, I don't know what the figure is, but let's well, say they're contributing 15%. Eddie, if it was 16%, that would be a lot of money. Eddie, Eddie, how many people in the United Kingdom? How many people are there in the UK? You're, there's an obsession. Even this is, a, is an obsession with these minute number of people who it's have minute. massive, and massive I, amounts of money. And you say, and you talk about, and? you talk about the shelves being empty. There are people in this yeah. country for whom the shelves are empty because they can't afford to buy food. What? One hundred percent. I get that. But what? It's still so why the can't the very richest give some a tiny proportion of their money to do massive amounts of good for the people who go to food banks? But they do. But they do give money. But, they give tax. But the they food banks are still tax, there. So perhaps gains, tax them a capital, little more. Income tax, capital gains tax. Yeah, why not tax them a little more? But for what reason? Then, then you know oh, what? I've just well, mentioned the food banks. For everybody. For everybody. I've just everybody mentioned the food banks. Eddie, how many people... The, the, the number of people who go to food banks is also, thank goodness, not that large. I mean, it's growing. It's, it's large and growing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Labour says it will build 100,000 new council houses a year by 2024 and then 50,000 housing association, affordable homes from housing associations. Uh, how many council houses did you build last year? Well, we built a significant number, and what I do What's know... What's that number? I don't have the exact number, Andrew, Okay, I we do. we built more than the last Labour government... Yeah, but the last Labour government hardly its built any. ...during period in office. You, you built 2,640. 
local authority homes, even though there's a waiting list of about a million. 2,640. The year before, you built 1,750. I mean, it's derisory, isn't it? We built 200, or rather the private sector, built hmm. 244,000 homes last year. That was the highest level of house no, no, building no, you, uh, excuse for me. 30 years. But this is you did, No, no, hold on. You didn't build 240,000 new homes. What you did was to create net additional dwellings of 240,000, which in call, involves new building, yes, but also conversion of existing mm. property stock to, to, uh, to residential use. You didn't build new, you converted quite a few as well. But I come back to the figure which was about council homes. We know there's a huge shortage of housing. Uh, it's one reason why house prices uh, have risen so much. But you've only built 2,640 local authority homes in England last year. Well, we're going to be building more homes in the social rented sector and also more homes in the private sector, Andrew. The fact is, if Labour got into power, investment in terms of housing would plummet. Any of these Are things, you in favour of building a much bigger council stock? I am in favour of building council houses, yes. Mm. So but why I'm don't also, you, why I'm don't also you do in favour of right to buy. I'm in favour of people who are council but, house tenants all right. being able to buy their homes. But and Labour are pledging it, to end right it, to buy in their manifesto. Right, but if you are in favour of more council houses, why aren't you doing it? We are building more council houses. Well, you're not. I've just given you the figures. Andrew, we have a plan for government which is about having a bigger private sector that grows the economy. We can yes. then afford, to, through taxes, to be all able right. to invest in public housing. You, what Labour are failing to do in their manifesto is answering the key question of this election, which is what are they going to do about Brexit? The fact <laughs> no, is, no, no, Labour... you can't talk. I'm sorry, it's, we're talking about housing. But it's the missing uh, thing. Uh, you can't They're not going to be yeah, do, able that. to do anything. Look, Andrew. This program They're not going to be able to do anything endlessly about Brexit. I'm talking about housing because it's actually one of the most important issues facing this country and doesn't get nearly enough airtime. And that's why I'm talking about housing, and it's also an important part of Labour's manifesto. And you're going to have some policies on it too. You say you had a plan. You have a plan. You had a plan in 2014 to build 200,000 new starter homes. That was five years ago. How many did you build? Well, there haven't been as many starter homes as we would have liked, How many Andrew? did you build? I don't have the exact numbers for well, you. Well, it's easy to remember. It's zero. You built none under that plan. 200,000 zero in five years there's a major vote winner so this is what i want to know how will it be funded which tax will it come from i want to know from the horse's mouth since you've now become a liberal democrat right now so uh thank you very much i, I think that's um a manifesto pledge that i personally am very committed to i was the childcare minister uh for a while and um having two young kids myself a five and a three-year-old I know how expensive our childcare is. Most parents are looking for flexible, affordable childcare, and this um, manifesto pledge is to do with that. We have said, um, in terms of how we're going to be funding uh, a lot of our education and schools, mainly out of our 50 billion remain bonus, that if we stay on in the EU, our economy, as every economist out there, an independent expert has said, will grow faster. So if, if Brexit happens, you won't be able to fund this? Right, so basically it's not a funded pledge, is it? So there's nothing like a business plan. If I'm going to buy something as a businessman, I want to know how it's going to be costed over five years. You've got my vote for five years. Five years later, I might vote for someone else. Five no, no. years, this is... I want to know the actual... If there is no tax or it's just a speculation... It's actually no, no, it's, 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 cannot be met, can it? No, it's, it's not a speculation because if we are in a position where we can actually influence government policy, we, will, we have said that we will be stopping Brexit. So if we are in that position, that's precisely what we'll be doing. And if Brexit so is if stopped, you stop Brexit, you're going to have £50 million pounds and that's 50, going to go on the 50, How much will it cost to fund nine hours of childcare? for the majority of parents. Have you worked it out? Have you got oh, yes, specific? we have We have worked out what the um, entire childcare package costs. And um, I, I haven't got the exact number for the so entire package. So you don't know? No, no, I haven't got it on me. I haven't got it on me. Why but we, 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 we do we do have a you, number you told for me, it. You just told me that it's something you were the childcare minister. You've just made the major pledge. Why don't you know? Why should I believe you? Um, Saul, I just don't have the number on me on every spending pledge that is in the manifesto. It's not every spending pledge, it's one of the major pledges 
of your party. Yes, I think Joe Swinson I'd in like her news conference said it was the biggest pledge. It is, it is. Uh, look, the, the number I've got in my mind is, is, is something like 4.3 billion. I've but got I've, a number in my mind, it's uh, 165 <laughs> billion. But no, I mean, it's not, no, no, because I, I, I've read it. But um, uh, we, it has been carefully costed. Our carefully manifesto costed. Had, from what? Sorry? From the possible 50 billion that we're going to possibly no, have. No, no, no. That's there are two questions. How do you pay for it and what is it going to cost? Right. Yes. And what is it going you to cost? You said it would come from the Remainer bonus. Uh, what, what is it going to cost? And I'm saying, I, if, if I remember it correctly, it's about 4.3 billion. In terms of how we get the money uh, to pay for what it's going to cost, it is the Remain bonus that will be Have used you put this in your manifesto? Is it fully costed of the numbers? It is, it is, it is in the manifesto. And is it full costing in the manifesto? Can I go on to it now? Can I read the full costings and can I read the full amount that it's going to be funded from? The manifesto should everyone tell everyone listening to this actually go and check out your business plan? <laughs> the manifesto does talk about how our spending pledges, major spending pledges, are funded. To go Sol, and Sol, do me a favour. It sounds like you've got a handful there anyway. But could you go, have you got time to go online in the course of the next half hour? Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to do that. Do that. Really, and, I'm and, I've been waiting for yep. about a month to have it. Call us back and let us know what it says. So, uh, hi, did you find the figures? Yep, I went on to the manifesto now. There are absolutely no figures. Um, there is a statement which says we'll do it. There is no costings of how much it will cost. Um, so at the moment it's just hot air. I can see that the everything's going to be taken out of this um, estimated 50 billion figure, which seems to have sort of been plucked out of thin air on more estimations. So it sounds like to me that this is just a sort of generalised wish list. And I, I mean, I really want to vote for Liberal Democrats, but I have no confidence in they've oh, actually uh, done sorry, any so, confidence. So during the break, you know, I managed to um, actually call the person at HQ who um, okay. put this together. Right. right, and I've got the exact number that you're looking for, and I hope that assuages your concern, because if your real yes. concern is you, you like the policy, how are we going to pay for it? Then yes. actually the cost of this entire policy is actually $14 billion. And it's so you were only, you were only $10 billion with your earlier Well, estimate. I did say that I wasn't sure. Yeah. And, I, right. and it's $14 and billion, and, and the years. way that it's paid for is... that is... over five years? It's, sorry? Is that over five years or one year? It's fourteen billion um, over the period. Oh, so that's over, over five years. Of what? Yes. yes, definitely of five, five years. I think so. Yeah. Okay. You think and so? It's, so you it's, don't it's, know. It's funded by. Can I? Can I? Put, so can I? Just, Look, and it's funded is it 14 by fourteen billion over five years or one year. How much is it going to cost over five years? Fourteen billion is what we've got costed in our manifesto, over and that's going to be years. funded by business tax increases. So corporation tax. So we're going to increase corporation tax from seventeen. By how much? from 17 to 20 percent and also uh, looking at a reform of capital gains tax and so it's by hitting small businesses so i'm self-employed now this is very good to know so by hitting small businesses i'm going to be paying a tax to specifically that tax the corporation tax is it's that is the specific tax that's going to pay for the extra target because i think it's a good deal quite frankly because if i if you hit me up three percent from 17 to 20, Out of your I might be paying another 5,000 a year. But if I'm saving myself 15,300, that's quite a good deal. But is that where it's coming from? Is that how it's going to be funded from corporation tax? Corporation tax increases and reforms to capital gains tax. Right, and what, and, and, and by, by, and how much will that bring in, that extra 3% a year, per year, how much will that bring in? I haven't got the full detailed workings behind every, every detail here with me in the studio. Why not? Because this is the point. No, no, no. But, but the fact that I haven't I, got I, it with I me cannot, doesn't mean I'm, we haven't thought about it. Look, put Saul, I'm taking... On, you've, joined, you've, joined a, a, you've joined a party which relegated on one of their most major promises about the tuition fees. And that's why the Liberal Democrats are so untrusted. And, you know... You Saul, have, you don't you sound like someone who's about, about to vote for the Liberal Democrats. Saul's just told I, you he loves this policy. He just wants to know how you're paying and for I've, it. And I've told just, him how we're paying for it. And by the way... By the way, in you this campaign me, you so told far... You've told me how to pay for it, but you haven't told me any figures. And the thing is, is I'm not a fool, and no one else is a fool, listening to all this. And people need to see numbers. And if they don't I've see numbers... I've given you a number. Goes, I've, given you, I've, I've given you a number. You've given me £14 billion over five years. That's your specific number. And you haven't told me how much by raising corporation tax by 3%... Well, I said we'll raise corporation tax and we'll reform capital gains tax. And will, those two, will, changes, will those two changes bring in £14 those, billion those two over changes, five years? Those two changes will be more than enough to fund this pledge. But it will take, uh, you, at least, it'll take at least a year for the money to come in, won't it? Sorry? At least it'll take at least a year for the changes to business tax and capital gains tax to come in. 
That's right, yes. So how are you going to pay for it in the first year? Well, you've also got to pass the legislation, right? So when you get into, if you're in a position, you've got to pass the legislation. The legislation doesn't happen on day one. Do you think it's realistic? 35 hours and nine months. Why aren't the other parties proposing it? Why shouldn't I vote for the Labour, which is saying two years? Why is not I vote for, uh, conser- I mean, read the Conservatives one year, but why, why, is, why is yours realistic? And why, why aren't they offering it if that's such a, is it, is it realistic? Because, Can you realistically- because every party has its priorities and a priority of ours is to support working families. How other parties decide to make, what they decide to make their priorities, how they fund, is a question why for Why have them. you left the Conservatives? Because that's the Conservatives thing. The Conservatives want to support working people. So why, what is, what is the key difference between this Liberal Democrats and the Conservative policy? Since you come from the Conservatives, why, why leave the Conservatives? It seems to be the same thing. What, what's, what, is this realistic? You were the child minister. Is this realistic? It is, it is. Or do it you is. think, do you think you'll have to water it down if you get into power? This is realistic and eminently deliverable. And the big difference between the Conservatives and the the Liberal Democrats is that the Conservatives, by pursuing a hard Brexit, are throwing the economic cards up in the air, which means the spending pledges that they are making. And by the way, they have not said a single thing about how they will pay for any pledge that they have made during this campaign. And the, um, those pledges are not worth the paper they are written on, because ultimately, if but you, you are... haven't written anything on paper, so I don't even know what your pledges are. Well, were. actually, <laughs> I, can, I think I can help everybody out here. I'm just looking at analysis from the BBC's education editor, Branwyn Jeffries, who I know, and uh, she knows her stuff. Uh, and she's uh, written, it's an eye-catching and potentially eye-wateringly expensive election promise. According to the independent economists at the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the Lib Dems' planned expansion of free childcare would represent an extra 13 billion a year. Right, so it's per year, so it's not over five years. So here, you know, I, haven't, I don't know about this. I'm learning. I'm having to ring the radio and find this out because I'm only ringing up now because it's such an important thing for me that will affect my family. And I, and I couldn't give a two flying... Well, yes, sorry, exactly. actually, I, you know, you know I, there's parts of Brexit which I obviously want to solve, but... So, this so just bear with me a second. I just, I just want to hear from uh, Sam Gima. I mean, Brandon Jeffrey is saying this is an extra 13 billion a year. And you were saying it's 14 billion over five years. Um, over the period right? is what I said, yeah. Well, no, but, no, but, no, but forgive me, don't say over the period. Uh, Saul asked you, and I pressed yes, you, my, on whether my, you meant my, five someone years. Someone has just texted me saying it's 14 billion a year as well, so that's right, yes. Okay. Who's on the text? Should we have them on the programme instead? Maybe, yeah. I mean, <laughs> corporation tax by raising anything. So, so for me, I mean, I'm not, you know, I have to tell you, if I'm, I mean, I've guessed... But, but we are provide. look, look, look. We I'm are providing the figures. If you were on Dragon's Den, you'd fail. You'd be chucked out. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, look, we, we are providing the figures, and I did not have it at my fingertips, but that doesn't mean that the figures are not there, and it doesn't mean that the progr- uh, this is not a well-costed, mm. um, well-costed manifesto pledge. It's, it's one thing and not it, to have the figures at your fingertips, but you shouldn't say you think it's over five years if you don't really know, can I suggest? Well, I... I, I I said that it was over the period, and and, and we asked you it over five years. We can we'll check but, the tape, but you said yes in response to that. You said it was fourteen billion over five years. Well, I, 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 is so I, 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 I stand it? corrected. Okay, thank you. Right. Well, this is an election, of course, in which a number of high-profile claims have already been debunked by independent fact checkers. Well, I spoke to the cabinet member Michael Gove a little earlier, and I asked him. Would he apologise on behalf of the Conservatives for misleading voters and would he rule out doing the same thing again? No. I think it's absolutely right that we do provide a factual account of what Jeremy Corbyn was saying in that debate. There were a number of things that uh, Mr Corbyn said that were simply not true, so we were calling him out on that. Uh, He was wrong about our policy on the NHS. And fundamentally also, it's important that he's held to account for his policy failures, in particular his failure to say in the referendum that he's so keen on holding whether or not he would back leave or remain in that second referendum. So you're not ruling out doing it again? I'm just saying that it's absolutely right that we should be in a position where we can call out those okay, untruths so that Labour are responsible for. OK. The fact of it being misleading, Twitter says, any further attempts to mislead people by editing verified profile information in a manner seen during the UK election debate will, recite, will result in decisive corrective action. Twitter thinks you misled people. Well, I'm sure... Did Twi- you mislead people, Mr. No, 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 no. Twitter will have its own view, and I respect Twitter's view, but the only misleading that was going on 
was Jeremy Corbyn misleading people about our policy on the NHS well, and Jeremy Corbyn you know it's from the Conservative and, Party because it it said so it was a, there was a direct link to the Conservative Party you point website to me, you show me it was a direct link show to the me, Conservative Party website you point to where it says Conservative I'm, I, I I shan't because this is your computer I don't know what you've been doing this to is it. what appeared on the Conservative CCHQ press it, Twitter feed last it night it pointed out me. that we were checking facts and it was from CCHQ so that's not misleading people you think? no it's from CCHQ so the voters we've shown it to this morning Nobody knew what CCHQ was. Well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that you found people who didn't they know that. They said it was misleading. Um, I'm, well, I'm sure if you um, find enough people um, uh, in the street, I'm sure you can find people who will corroborate your version of accounts. Have you got form on this, Mr. Gove? This is Vote checking. Leave saying that is not they fact will checking. ban tea kettles. You led Vote Leave. There are now people from Vote Leave involved in the Conservative election campaign. Of course there are. Is this a lie? Because, no. Do you recognise this one, though? Um, uh, uh, one of the things about... Do you recognise this one, Mr. Gove? Uh, I, I certainly... Yeah. Now, one of the things so that I think EU is important... So the EU wants to ban kettles. Is that a lie? No, it's not. The EU had particular rules which related, in, in their view, to energy policy, which meant that there were particular types of electrical device that they wanted to ban, as they have banned particular they didn't want types to ban of kettles, light bulbs in the past. They were talking about energy efficiency. They didn't want to ban kettles. Yes, so that means that there were certain... No, it's not. It means that there were certain kettles that you could no longer manufacture. You use the L word. That's a very powerful word. Um, uh, what you're attempting to do is to make a polemical case no, against... I'm just asking for the truth in this election. No, you're Mr. making Gale. a polemical case for a particular viewpoint. No, I'm because, not asking you for the truth. Because, do you believe in the truth because, in an election campaign, Mr. Gove? Do you believe in telling the truth? Uh, because you have a particular outlook, because you... I don't have a particular outlook. This is scrutiny, Mr. Gove. You want to talk about getting Brexit done? Yes. You, you said that the transition period could not be extended. Now, is that true or false? Because people won't deserve be to know before an election, don't they? It won't be, it won't be extended. Yes. But it could be extended. Well, if you had, for the sake of argument, a Labour government, if you had Jeremy Corbyn, then what we would have would be uh, not just months, but years of uncertainty. If we have a majority Conservative government with a working majority, we can get Parliament working again. And as a result of that, we will be able to make sure that we can move on to the people's priorities. And our announcement today, um, which I, I know that you will cover fairly, of additional investment in agriculture and in the environment for the lifetime of the whole Parliament will be underpinned. We have your words that it won't be extended, not that it couldn't be extended. Of yes. course, your word was also that Boris Johnson was not fit to be Prime Minister. Then you served into Boris Johnson. Your word was that we didn't vote to leave the EU with no deal. Then you became the Minister for No Deal. Can people trust your word in this election, Mr Gove? Well, that, that was a good speech, um, and I'm sure it would go down well on any election platform. These are things that you have said, are they uh, not? Uh, well, there are things that... I'm, I'm quoting your own words at you. No, you're not. You're making a, um, a polemical no, argument, not. which you're I'm very I'm good I'm at. I'm quoting your own words. I'm, I'm, you I'm, I'm, I think, I think, no deal. As someone, who, as someone who was a journalist in the past and wrote polemics and then became a politician, then of course you're, you're well on the what, way what to going down that do? route. Can we take your word in this election that you will deliver what you say you will? Oh yes, absolutely. Just look at our record in government. We have delivered a good deal. And now that we have this good deal, we will be able to leave the European Union on January the 31st if we get a working majority, and I'm sure we will. Thank you. I, um, you keep saying, Alan, it's one of the things that I've kept hearing over and over again, is mm. that we can't make our own laws because yep. of the EU, and it's something that a previous call has just asked. Uh, let's say we left on the 31st of January and we're out. What one thing would you change straight away that we cannot do now that is going to vastly enhance my life for the better? Well, I don't know what will enhance your life for the better, unless you tell me, but what I do know is that from that date, uh, we will be free. And the one thing I must make quite clear, I think everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people imagine that the instant we leave, somehow all the bureaucracy that we've suffered over the years is going to disappear. It will have to be a very gradual business of repeal uh, and introducing new things. Uh, so, uh, no, no, hang on, hang on. I'm trying to give you the responsible answer, which is okay. there isn't going to be a magic wand on January the 31st. But what we will be able to do from then on is to set up trade deals, which we can't at the moment, and they will take a while to set up. You won't get them on February the 1st. Uh, and what we can do is look at all the regulation which we have got from the EU. For example, let me give you one. Let me give you one. Uh, fishermen's nets, which you may think is a bit esoteric. But actually, I've got fishermen um, in the constituency in which I'm standing, uh, who have, and indeed throughout the South West, which I already represent as an MEP, who are facing a massive drop in their income because the EU, the EU, 
has prescribed new net sizes through which some of their catch is just going to disappear. And, and if, you, if you don't mind, if I could just interrupt and just have, have sort of 20 seconds there. Yeah. Fishing makes up such a tiny, tiny proportion of the GDP of this country. It's pathetic <laughs> that the Brexit Party continually bang on about fishing. Yes, when, we do. When you're, yes, when we your do. leader... No control over our own waters. ...in 10 years. What about the finances? What about the banking industry? What about the technology industry that is going to be gutted and destroyed by Brexit. What, and yeah. my, my question in fairness was, what one thing is going to enhance my life by leaving the EU what, and being able what, what to job, make our own laws? What job do you do, Ian? I work for myself. I'm self-employed as a financial advisor. I have a, a good standard of living. I'm comfortable. I've never known my life in, in any other way than being within the EU. Okay, well, I don't see a single benefit to me or my family to leave in the EU. So, and I'd like Anne to tell me. Well, give, it, give, him, give him one benefit. Well, I mean, I've already given three benefits several times. Well, the fishing tonight. nets no, doesn't no, no. benefit him, no, does I, it? I'm not talking about that. I said I've already given three benefits that we can make our own laws. We can repeal such but a what law. what law would you like? to make finish. that we can't do now. That I'm, will I'm jolly going to finish the sentence. I'm jolly going to finish the Go sentence, on. which is that we can make our own laws, we can control our own borders, uh, and we and we also um, can do our own trade deals. Now, those to me are such big benefits that they absolutely overarch everything. But if you want a little one, well, I've already mentioned it once tonight, high street shops, for example, gradually going under. Uh, people suffer when the high street shops How disappear. How has the EU contributed to that? And what we're saying is um, that we will, uh, well, I'm just telling you what the Brexit Party is going to do, uh, that we are going to abolish the business rates that, that cause them such but problems. But we could do that and in the EU as well. Well, actually, yes, we could do that within the EU, but there are a lot of financial things but that all, we can't all, all do. But all he's asking is something that well, a, a new law that you want to bring in that we couldn't at the moment that will affect Ian's life for the better. Well, all I can say is, Ian, that there are many things that we can do, but if you want me to give you one snap law that's going to benefit you, then all I can say is, if you won't benefit from an independent Britain, if all you're concerned about is your desk and your revenues, sorry. I can't help you. Uh, Simon is in Oxford. Simon, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. How are you? Very well. Good. Um, well, I thought I'd have a, a tiny go at defending the indefensible, because I, I know it's, uh, uh, it's a very difficult one, and, um, <laughs> and I'm not sure... I'm, I'm not, <laughs> you're not, I'm not, sure you're not exactly not... overflowing with confidence here, Simon. <laughs> but but no, go on. No. Do, do, do you mean Pretty Patel's comments as opposed to this... <laughs> broader right. question of why why we're in an election in which the government is attacking the government's record go on then so so yeah, let I'm, me play I'm, the I'm let me it. play the clip again for people who missed it so so Four out of 10 children in parts of barrow are born into poverty that's not good enough is it well it's appalling and of course but everybody and it's not just people in westminster it's not just at a national level it's at a local level through the, it's the government and you've had nearly 10 years well it's not the government though is it i mean every, everybody just says it's the government as if it's this sort of like bland blob that you know you can just go and blame. So the government's it's, not responsible it's for poverty. Actually, it's well, it's it's not because it's all parts of society and the structures. Local authorities have a role to play. Education, public services, which are locally led and locally run. Now you know and I know that education, public services, and local authorities all have their budgets set by government, and that um, all of those budgets have been cut fairly stringently since 2010. But but. Um, Go on then, mount your defence. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, I, I guess the, 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 the small point I'm trying to make is I, I do rem I'm old enough to remember, yes. um, but probably too old to remember exactly when it was. <laughs> uh, it, yes, go on. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, the election in the United States when Ronald Reagan surprised and got in. And I remember the mantra he kept saying, which was, which are the nine most frightening words in the English language? Yes. And the answer was, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> and and he, he won a landslide and he did it throughout states that had been traditionally democratic because it resonated with people. So I'm not here to defend uh, Pretty Patel. I'm sure she's... You were a minute ago. Uh, I'm <laughs> here to defend the one point. Yes. Which is... I don't think it's a bad thing for government 
to say to the people. I mean, this, this, so much about this election is about truth. So is it really right to criticise a politician who's actually admitting that there is a limit to what the government can do? No, but that, I now, mean, if she'd done that, you'd be absolutely banged to rights and you'd be making a very powerful point. With the greatest of respect, she didn't do that, did she? She claimed it was nothing to do with government and then listed at least three things that are entirely dependent upon government, not just for their funding, but for their policies as well. Who brought in universal credit? The government or someone else? Well, rather than... Answer the question. I'm sorry? Who brought, in, <laughs> who brought in universal credit? The government or someone else? I don't think that's the point. Well, I, it's my question. I'd be grateful if you'd answer it. Uh, well, I, I was asked to phone in and make a point, which I've made. Would you like to answer my point, which is that I think it's no bad thing for a government minister to be honest with the election. Yeah, but I don't, I, I, I'm trying to clarify her honesty. I'm trying to clarify whether she has been honest or not. I'm examining your point. So uh, crucial to that examination is, is this question. If she says poverty has, has nothing to do with the government, and I say... I who, don't, she who, did. I who, don't think she did. Well, let's listen to it again then, shall we? Uh, we go if you like, but I think what's the, the point... No, I, I think I'm, you're making a very good point, and I don't think she did make you. that point. Your point is that you can't... I mean, there has to be personal responsibility involved in these processes as well, but that wasn't her point, because she was listing things that she thinks we can blame for poverty, local authorities, education, public services, while somehow claiming that the government's hands are clean on those areas, whereas you know and I know that the government not only sets their budgets, but also defines their policies, which is why the question of who introduced universal credit is not only pertinent but also crucial. But it, behind that question, to which you obviously want me to answer the obvious one, which is, is, is the not, government... It doesn't have to be obvious, just has to be correct. Well, yeah, yes or no, and it's obviously yes that the government introduced it, but behind yes. that question is an assumption you're making that the introduction of universal credit or a whole host of other things are either silver bullets towards the poverty that we inevitably have in this country... No, it's not, it's not an opinion. I mean, you know and I know that food bank use, 60 to 65% of food bank users are there as a direct result of bureaucratic snafus with universal credit applications. And, and I think food bank use is a fairly reliable indicator of, of what most of us would file under poverty. And that was a government policy. Universal credit has seen an explosion in the use of food banks. And I, and I could go on. I mean, you, she talks about education. We could talk about education budgets. She talks about... Um, there's 1.6 million food bank parcels in the last year. And the Trussell Trust called daily for, um, for an end to this five-week wait in universal credit. So if you've got no food for five weeks, as a direct result of government policy... I don't see where personal responsibility would come into that. But, but I shall say it again. I think you make a good point. I think you make a mistake when you suggest that Pretty Patel made the point that you made. Reg is in Kingswood. Reg, what would you like to say? Hi. Good morning, James. Hello, okay. Um, I'm at the other side of this equation. I pay ridiculously high taxation. Um, ridiculous. Um, is it, was it 45, the top, top rate now, or is it 40? I think it's for, I, I'm almost creeping to 48 somewhere along the way, my accountant tells me. But anyway... Well, not on income uh, tax, you're not. So what is the top rate of income tax at the moment? I think it's 45. Right. Above what threshold? Above above uh, 80 or 50. I, I don't even know the numbers, to be honest with you. But my, well, my, no, it's very important that we establish this, if you're going to cast yourself as the, as the, 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 the big hitter, as it were. I think it's... Is it not 45% above £150,000? I mean, you're complete... You need a new accountant, Reg. Mm. <laughs> He's ripping yeah, you off yeah, blind. No, no, no. The, the, the numbers are so but, ridiculous. No, 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 no it's for? not that. You tell me what you think the top rate of tax is and tell me what you think the threshold is for that top rate of tax. Otherwise, I don't I, see I how think, you... I think you're dead right on the 150. I, I can't remember where 40 kicks in and where 45 kicks in. Right. I think it's 150. Okay. Okay. But my thing is, I'm in... But you're going to crack on with this. You just phoned in and you didn't know what the tax thresholds were, but you're here to tell me that they're awful. They're, they're awful, James. But you didn't know they're what they awful. were. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I get that. That's why I've got an accountant. He, he gives me my bill and then we have to pay it. Well, I think he's um, ripping you off. Seriously. My accountant? Well, if you didn't know what, what the top threshold was or the top tax rate... And you're just taking no, he what he tells you as gospel. I, I'm like Henry, I'm like I think Henry he's... Henry mate, I just, I've got him on the other line. He's in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> he's, just bought a new, he's just bought a new yacht. Anyway, t t anyway, I'll get my violin out and you tell me why you pay too much tax. 
Yes. We'll pay too much tax. And one of the things that gets to me is I'm in a position where we assess um, credit applications in, in our business. Yes. And I see how much tax credit we pay to multinational firms. So my tax, your tax, James, goes to subsidize their payrolls, for example. And I wouldn't name names because I don't want any litigation. But well, if it was true, there wouldn't be any litigation, would there? Well, it's true. It's true, and, and we see it. These right. people that, that don't even pay corporation tax. What I think politicians need to rise up and do is for everybody to pay an equal rate of tax of somewhere around 20, 25 percent. I'll give you a simple example that works very, very well. It's the VAT. If you now leave Leicester Square and you're going to go buy a bit of tool for your house in Chiswick there, Right? Um, yes. You would buy and you would pay 20% VAT on that tool. Yes. Uh, if a multi billionaire comes around and they need the same sort of tool, they will pay 20% of that tool. What happens is this, this, this uh, tax on ambition. So people want I to progress. I, I, I think you're talking gibberish. And if, you, if you'd only known what the tax rates were that you're here to condemn, then I might have given you a little bit more time to, 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 to expand upon your theory of epic selfishness. But I, 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 I think I've given you too much time already, Reg. No hard feelings, mate. But seriously, next time you ring in to talk about the tax, just check the numbers. And of course, VAT is a punitive tax. It's a horribly punitive tax. Because a single mother who is existing on universal credit pays the same percentage of VAT as a billionaire on everything. And that's rank. Which is why, when you see the stories about the top 1% of earners pay 30% of income tax, it is deliberately designed to let let me use my words carefully, to let dangerous crud like that gain credibility. But thank you so much for the call. Is the royal family fit for purpose? Does it just need a bit of improvement, as Jeremy Corbyn suggests, or as an institution, is it beyond reproach? Juliet is oh, in Somerset. Hi, Juliet. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I think as an institution it's quite a good thing. I think it's a horrible job for all its members. I mean, they really have a beastly time. They're in the public eye the whole time. They can't say anything. They can't be anywhere. They can't go out with anybody. They can do almost nothing without thousands of people coming in and saying how awful it is because, I suppose, we pay for them through taxes. But I mind politicians worse because we elect them and then they mess things up, whereas at least the royal family aren't elected. However, I think the women of the royal family, Princess Anne and the Queen, do a wonderful job. They're an example to us all of patience, forbearance, and help. I mean, extraordinary ladies. The gentlemen are more like gentlemen and wanted to be helped by the ladies, I think. Anyway, I, I mean, I, I think they're, they're up to it. Poor old Andrew, though. I mean, how did he get into this scrape? He must have... They had a terrible time. Think of the Queen with four children and really no time to look after them. I mean, the whole thing is just in a very difficult situation. And if we treat them like normal human beings... Well, we can't, can we? Well, can't we? No, we can't. They're cocooned from life. They don't get the rough and tumble of nursery schools and going shopping and all that stuff, kicking a football in the streets with other kids and discovering what people are really like. How can they know anybody? We should have sympathy for them all. We should, yes. Should we... What sort of behaviour should we excuse? I think we should expect rather better from some of them than we've had. Um, but I think we should actually be very careful to think about the position they're in and what we would do if we were in that sort of position. It is not as easy as it looks. It may look very easy. The Queen was out riding with Andrew this morning, I understand. She says, Mum, of course she was. She'd be the person he, she'd want to talk to him. Well, she sacked him this week. Yeah, yeah but, but she's still his mum. Is there a way back for Prince Andrew, do you think? I don't know. I don't mind, really. There are plenty of the rest of them getting on with it. Too many of them? Um, probably not, actually. I mean, the amount of royal duties they have, probably about the right amount. Um, but, I mean, look at what's happened to the poor young boys and their wives. They're all having a beastly time, aren't they, really? Juliet, thank you. Lord Helen is in Oxted. Royal family, fit for purpose. Helen, hello. Definitely. I've just come in from shopping, and I'm sick to death of people knocking the monarchy, wanting to do over the House of Lords, want to tear everything down. The pageantry that we do to the second when we put these things on with the gold coach going down the mile, it's uplifting. Who's going to be in its place? Flaming Corbyn? I mean, 
there's a magic to this sort of thing which people need. And this modern generation seem to be tearing at everything. Yes, Prince By Andrew modern... made a mistake and he mixed with a low life. Mm. And there's, there's often one in every family that does something awful. But the Queen is wonderful. And I'm so angry with people that want to destroy everything. There's well, well, my point, my point Helen, place. is is isn't it Prince Andrew um, that we should be thinking about here? Isn't it his behaviour that's raising it's these questions? It was appalling. And I, I also think the BBC should have pulled back and notified the Queen of what was happening instead of Emily Maitlis taking the kudos from a wonderful, uh, you know, briefing. Uh, the, the, the outcome from it of the people that hate royalists all ringing in and the Queen, I mean, she's 93, she shouldn't have to go through this. I think the whole thing has been very, very badly managed. Yes, I don't think anything of him. And yes, the royalty is being slimmed down anyway. Is but without the royal family, we have no magic. Helen, thank you. I know he's a more.